call the meeting to order. This is this is the Planning Commission meeting of Tuesday, November 24th, 2015. Roll call. Dickman here. Johnston here. Grillo here. David here. Scafidi here. Grzykowski here. Corral here. Seepert here. Chandler here. Item two is minutes of the November 10th, 2015 meeting. Mr. Dickman makes a motion that we approve the minutes of the November 10th, 2015 meeting. Seepert seconds. Oh, hold on just a second, please. Sure, go ahead, Carrie. Uh, I had a phone call from Mr. Arden Degner who wanted to have his comments on one of the items clarified. So if you turn to page 10 of 25, he would like his comments to uh, reflect the fact that he mentioned a 40 foot drop north to south and a 10 foot uh, span between the group of homes, which would be a hazard in snow. So we will have the minutes change to reflect his comments more accurately. Does the tape record reflect those comments? That's, we will check that. All right, yeah, I wouldn't change them until we verify that that's what happened. Okay, uh, we had a um, second. Seepert agrees. Okay, um, roll call. Uh, Dickman, aye. Johnston, aye. Grillo, aye. David, aye. Speedy, aye. Guzikowski, aye. Grillo, aye. Seepert, aye. Chandler, aye. Item three is significant common council actions. Carrie. Common council approved an ordinance amending the another ordinance allowing automobile and truck engine and body repair and storage of vehicles and equipment on a portion of the property located at 6925 South 6th Street. And also authorized the city administrator to enter into an amended market contract with the journal broadcast group for advertising as part of the Packers Radio Network and Brewers Radio, Radio Network to promote the City of Oak Creek for the 2016 regular seasons. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Item four is a public hearing on a comprehensive plan amendment request. It's a, a public hearing on the uh, proposed amendment to the 2020 vision, a comprehensive plan for the City of Oak Creek that would update the plan land use category and map two in the comprehensive plan for the properties as listed on South 20th Street, South 27th Street, and West Drexel, and West Ross, and tax key numbers, multiple as listed. Doug? I'm going Carrie? to read the uh, notice into the record. Okay. Official notice to be um, published October 22nd, 2015. Notice of public hearing before the Oak Creek Plan Commission, purpose of which is to consider an amendment to the 2020 vision, a comprehensive plan for the city of Oak Creek, as it relates to the properties at 7951, 8067, 8210, 8245, 8310, and 8351 South 20th Street, 7312 South 20th, 27th Street, 1741R, 1830R, 1901, 2200, 2211, 2300, 2305, 2319, 2361, and 2500 West Drexel Avenue, and 1965 West Rawson Avenue. The hearing date is Tuesday, November 24th, 2015 at 6 p.m. at the Oak Creek City Hall, 8040 South 6th Street, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, 53154 in the Common Council Chambers. Thank you, good evening. My name is Doug Seymour. I'm the Director of Community Development for the City of Oak Creek. And this is a public hearing and a request to amend the comprehensive plan for those areas in the vicinity of 20th and Drexel. Uh, those addresses that were previously listed by Carrie and included in both the public hearing notice and the staff report. If, if we could please maybe get the graphic up on the screen. Thank you. You'll recall, or most of you recall, that in 2013 the city entered into a tri party exchange agreement with Milwaukee County and Northwestern Mutual to transfer and convey lands in the vicinity of Falk Park. As part of that transaction, the county received some additional high value wetlands and woodlands that were previously in private ownership. Uh, Northwestern Mutual received 60 acres of farmland along the interstate, and the city received a 17 acre site uh, that it later exchanged with the school district and is now the site of the construction of a new elementary school. Uh, this amendment to the comp comprehensive plan reclassifies those parcels according to their new use. So essentially, and you know, if, if you'll recall this, uh, the exchange that took place between the, the three different parties, uh, the comprehensive plan amendment that we're proposing this evening, let's make sure you get the right one here for you. It 
it takes those properties that were involved in that land exchange and it reclassifies them into their, their current or what their proposed land use designation would be. For example, and I didn't bring a pointer, but uh, the lands that were previously part of Falk Park, which were now acquired by the city and then transferred over to the school district, uh, although they were shown as resource protection area under the existing comprehensive plan because they were part of Falk Park when we did the plan, uh, those areas are now being reclassified as institutional to reflect their current use and their planned use as a school. Uh, many of the areas that are now part of Falk Park were in the private ownership and in fact were classified as single family residential. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, those parcels that are now part of Falk Park are being reclassified as resource protection area, which is the proper designation for a park. Uh, and just for example, you can see that any of the parcels that were involved in the land exchange are shown in the, the dark hash lines. Uh, those are the only parcels that are being changed as part of this comprehensive plan amendment. There was also 60 acres that was previously part of Falk Park uh, that was exchanged with Northwestern Mutual, which is now, which was under, was, was being farmed. That acreage now, <laughs> it's dying. Come on. The acreage that you see in purple on the right hand map is uh, being farmed. That was exchanged and is no longer part of Falk Park. Uh, that, those properties are being proposed as planned mixed use. Oh, bless you. When the city entered into that tri-party exchange agreement, it did so uh, with the understanding that, and I'll show you the language in that, that the city would use its good faith best efforts to rezone those properties to reflect their actual usage after the closing. Obviously, we've, we've closed on that. Uh, so, in essence, what we are doing is cleaning up the comp plan, comp plan, in a sense, to reflect the changes that resulted as part of that tri-party agreement. Uh, one of the things that you'll note is that the state of Wisconsin Conference Planning Law requires that any actions that are taken uh, by local governments uh, uh, post, I think it was 2012, must be concurrent and current with the, the land use map and their comprehensive plan. So in essence, any rezonings that you would have to take, have to make would be, have to be consistent with a comprehensive plan. So as these properties develop, uh, and re as rezonings come in, they need to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So this will be the first step in the ultimate alignment of the zoning map with our comprehensive plan. Uh, this is a public hearing. I would ask that anyone who has any questions or comments regarding the proposal to amend the comprehensive plan to uh, classify those properties that were involved in the Falk Park Land Exchange in accordance with their current or planned use to please approach the microphone. I'm, I'm sorry, we've changed a little bit. Uh, if to please fill out a form, and when the mayor calls your name, please approach the microphone, give your name and address, and proceed to address your questions and or comments to the commission. Uh, mayor call three times. This public hearing is now open. Thank you, Mr. Degner. Arden Degner. Arden Degner, 8540 South Pennsylvania Avenue. I am unsure of exactly how much of this land is buildable, how much is floodplain, and where will the barrow pit be located to fill in areas that are in floodplain? Could you give me some information on, on that particular area? Because I understand that there was a, that was the reason why Falk Park was located there, because it was a wetland. Doug? If, if I may, I mean, and it's important to note that this is a comprehensive plan amendment. There are no detailed plans that, aside from actually the school district has, that ha, who is under construction uh, for those properties that have been submitted. But when they were, when they would be submitted, obviously we look at the, see what environmental, environmentally sensitive lands would be placed on those properties. Uh, one important item to note as well is that if there are any environmentally sensitive areas on these properties, which are not shown as part of the proposed land change, and many of those fall, fall within Falk Park. But there are some, for instance, that do exist on the school district property. I mean, the, those environmental corridors will remain in place. The, the change in the comprehensive plan does not do anything to negate their status as being protected under the 
environmental corridors or the wetlands to the floodplain. So this action does not change that. Uh, when develop would development would occur, if there would occur on those properties, they'd be required to identify those wetlands. Uh, they'd be re required to identify the floodplain. They'd be required to identify whatever stormwater management there were areas there would be. Uh, but that is not the case at this early stage in the process. Go ahead, Mr. It boggles Berger. my mind to think that here we have the City Plan Commission and all these uh, groups that are meeting and have worked out these details with the county and they claim no knowledge of floodplain and floodways. What no, really concerns me, what really concerns me right there, is Mr. this Dagger. purple area there that may be the, uh, a choice buildable lot and I've, I'm just afraid of what's going to, uh, that we're not getting the uh, a good trade. As I stated earlier, and a couple of things, as I stated earlier, the presence of wetlands and or floodplain is not affected one bit, one bit, by this action that the Planning Commission would take this evening or the Council would take at a subsequent meeting. If it's floodplain, it's still floodplain. If it's wetland, it's still wetland. Uh, this, and you made some comments at the end of, of your uh, testimony about this not being a good trade. I mean, this, this trade was, this land exchange was reviewed by the county, by Northwestern Mutual, and by the city back in 2012. It was vetted uh, substantially. And in fact, all three parties thought it was, in fact, a good deal to expand the boundaries of Falk Park substantially, to create a 17-acre site for a new elementary school, and to take land which was part of Falk Park, which in essence was only being farmed, and make that available for future development. So I think that all three, in all three instances, they saw the value of making that trade. I would say that the three parties, the school district, the city of Oak Creek, and Northwestern Mutual have all said on record that they think it was a, a, a great agreement, uh, mutually beneficial to all parties. So I think it's worked out pretty well. Um, again, if you have a, a second call for public comment on 5A, 4A rather, if you have a public comment, please fill out this form, hand it to me, and I'll call your name. You're collecting them all, huh? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ann Lampy, former alder person in the third district. Welcome. Watertown Plank Road. <laughs> um, I'm concerned about the mixed use behind the properties along Drexel Avenue. Whether or not the infrastructure in place can support mixed use. Mixed use is always a kind of a Pandora's box. There's so many different things that can go in there to put it in there as mixed use without knowing exactly what's being proposed, I think does not serve the city well. I, I understand about, you know, the, that the trade and everything went in. Um, that land was not farmed until this year, actually. It was, it was just tall grasses. I, I know because we have bees near there and it was tall grasses. So if, if this is going to impact the road that was already just done on Drexel Avenue at great expense to the city and the infrastructure under there cannot support whatever is going to go in there, then the city is going to be paying for that road twice. And that's a concern. Also concerned if the expansion of 20th that's going on now would be able to hold whatever that use is, that mixed use, if that road is going to be big enough. Putting that next to a school, whatever it is, if, it, if it's a high traffic situation next to a school, I think is a problem. I think you have to look at what's already there and, and take that into consideration more than anything. Because if you have conflicting uses, it doesn't do the city any good. So that's, that's mostly my concern is, okay. is that impact of something high traffic, high high volume at that location. Thanks for your comments. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Mr. Mayor, would you like me to 
respond to yes, that? Yes, absolutely, Doug, go ahead. Sure, and just very quickly, I mean, it's not uncommon, and in fact, it's the purpose of a, a plan use map, land, planned land use map and a comprehensive plan to identify areas that would be available for future development. In fact, these areas in the, it's tough to see, the color's a little bit different, but the kind of the purple areas that you see here, in fact, are areas which are designated as, as planned mixed use. And the comprehensive plan specifically calls out the area in the vicinity of 13th Street and Drexel. And, and remember, that this comprehensive plan was done prior to the, there being an interchange at Drexel Avenue as a potential area for planned mixed use. So I mean, I certainly uh, understand the concerns about having the infrastructure in place to support whatever may develop on those properties. And I mean, that's something that will need to be addressed if and when those properties develop. But at this point in time, I think it's it's proper uh, within the confines and the constraints of that tri-party agreement and that the plan mixed use is the appropriate land use, land use designation for that area. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next is C.H. Schmidt. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt, um, I'd just like to know that uh, maybe back up the truck a little bit now. Are we really, do we, were we want to rezone the houses on the west side of Drexel Avenue and on the east side to manufacturing or industrial or commercial? Is no. This, no, we're not going to do that at all. That's, that's, okay. Go ahead, Doug. No, this is, this is not changing anything. In fact, the only things that are changing, uh, let me pull that map up once again for you. Uh, and, no, and as a matter of fact, no zoning is changing. This is a comprehensive land use plan amendment. Come on. The only properties which are changing their land use designation are those which are identified by the black <coughs> hash marks, and those are those properties that were involved in the tri-party exchange between the county and Northwestern Mutual and the city. Nothing east of I-94. Okay, <clears throat> but it's still possible that the houses, well, east, uh, the south side and north side of uh, Drexel Avenue could be, you know, if, if this was mixed usage, behind these houses, it could very well be rezoned, you know, the houses that are being there. What are the, say, the pros and cons on, say, commercial, they want to buy your property out for business, you know, say, get a change to commercial. What would be the pros and cons of, hey, you don't want to move, you want to stay there. Can you, can they kick you out? Can you stay there, residential, Who, this is they? not conforming? Who's they? whoever would want to build or a commercial, no, the city, say the city says, uh, we want to rezone this to commercial because right behind us is commercial or mixed usage. Residential might not fall into, you know, this area of commercial. So what I'm saying is, okay, you have this Ulster, you bought this property. Can you live there without being moved? You know, say you don't have to stay there anymore. Are you talking about 13th Street? Drexel Avenue. I think first Drexel, of all, you're, Drexel. If, yeah. if I may, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you're speculating about a possible rezoning. That's not what we're doing okay. this evening. It's outside the scope of what we're talking but, about. But I mean, I think that it's up to the, the, the landowner to decide their options and to, upon consultation, certainly if you have questions from the city's perspective uh, about the land use plan and what may or not be, you know, in your mind, what's best for you as a property owner, we'd be happy to kind of run you through what some of the impacts may be, but ultimately, obviously, that's your decision as to whether you feel, how you feel that affects your property. Okay, well, here's the thing, though, too. If you, and I'm sure everybody knows, that on the north side of Drexel Avenue, Northwest Mutual owns all the houses except for maybe a lot in one house. Okay. So they kind of can do what they want. You know, they own everything along 27th Street and that, so... You're kind of in a, a little area right there, and eventually, you know, see, you like it, you know. So my big concern is, you know, I'm against all this, you know, but I just want to know that, you know, what are our ramifications if we stayed there? I mean, you, you probably can't, you know, and wait until it's commercial going in there. And Oak Creek is, I've lived in Oak Creek for all my life, and Oak Creek changes all the time. The city never stays the same, I suppose that's, part of it ever since uh, the, uh, the AC moved in there, Soul Creek the City Hall moved over this way, where it was. The police department is over on Highway 100. We always, we came to a lot of common council meetings. It, 
It's never the same. I mean, we could be in a few more years and might change a bunch of other things in Oak Creek. Well, that's progress, I guess. But like I said, you know, it's like Northwest Mutual, I don't know, they seem to run the show in that area. I think Oak Creek goes along with what they say and vice versa. Maybe not, maybe yes, but uh, I think for the residential person that bought land in, that pro on, uh, in the time ago, it, it was all fields and everything. So now we have to go with the, well, what's going on with society and everything with the commercial. So I don't like it anyway. But one thing I have to say though, we noticed it tonight, the lights, the Christmas lights going down Drexel Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> we never noticed that before, so, so I just got to say. So you're giving that a thumbs up then? Yeah, that yeah. Right. that's good. It <laughs> looks really good. So that's a change for the positive. Yes, that's yeah. a change for the positive. All right. Okay, thanks. Your comments are noted. Thank you. All right. Uh, I just I don't know if this is first name or last name. Ryan. That first name. Hmm. You want to give your last name? Mauch. Spell it for me, please. M a u g h a n. And I'm not asking for address because they're already provided on the That's forms. Fine. Go ahead. Um, my question is, is, you kept talking about the 2020 comprehensive plan. What is that? Doug? The 2020 comprehensive plan was a plan that was adopted by the city back in 2002, April of 2002. Uh, at that point, the state mandated that every municipality, every uh, minor civil division had to have a comprehensive plan to guide their future growth. And in court, there was a, uh, the state statute required a certain number of elements, for instance, housing, transportation, future land use map, uh, utilities and infrastructure. It's just a, a prudent document to help guide the council as they make their decisions with respect to the future land use in the community. Okay, and as far as Hanadel Woods, which is part of the land swap, mm -hmm. what was that zone for the 2020 comprehensive uh, plan? The comprehensive plan doesn't show zoning. I'm, I'm just sorry, what was it that. proposed? It, it, a lot of that was proposed as limited, I'm sorry, not proposed, it was actually illustrated and defined as limited development area okay. in recognition of uh, some of the, the high quality woodlands that were in private ownership. Okay, so it wasn't like in near the residential end of it, it was, was it, it planned for mixed use or was it planned for residential? The areas uh, adjacent to the Hondale Woods, specifically on the southern part of, uh, of Drexel Avenue uh, were shown as residential primarily, there were some proposals uh, for multifamily development adjacent to that, uh, but for the most part it was shown as residential. So how come, if we took Connell Woods, which was mostly planned as residential, why are we planning the swap as mixed use? Well, the, the areas that are planned for mixed use are those areas which were taken out of public ownership, which did not contain those high quality wetlands or woodlands as defined by the DNR and in fact, by their approval of that land swap uh, and those taking out of the Falk Park and taking out of a program that was called LAWCON, Land and Water Conservation Act, uh, that signified that those lands were no longer met the criteria of what would be preserved under that resource protection area. Okay, I'm just, you know, if, I, I guess with, if you take land from one spot that was proposed to be residential, you take it away and make that park, don't you need to set aside that much land to stay residential? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Uh, my second question is about the school. You've got this big new school going up, mm -hmm. and you're going to have a lot of cars going by the new school to get back to this mixed use area. Are we going to have any kind of precautions? Normally, schools are built in residential neighborhoods, so all the neighbors can kind of keep an eye on the schools. We're not going to have people from out of town possibly coming in, driving past every day trying to see what's there to buy. Uh, so with being mixed use, you don't have a real high residential outlook. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, the area, and, and you're right, the prior speaker said that Northwest Mutual owned a, a number of acres, I think about 120 acres, a little bit more, uh, in that quadrant uh, between the freeway and 27th Street. Uh, the great majority of that, even though we're not addressing that as part of these comprehensive plan amendments, is still planned to be residential and planned to be developed as a neighborhood. The 60 acres that we're talking about is roughly t 60 acres that's proposed for planned mixed use uh, was as part of contemplated in the, the tri-party exchange agreement uh, was designated for development. Uh, 
plan mixed use does allow, if they so chose to pursue it, does allow some residential in there. I don't know what their plans are for that. And you know, if, if they wanted to propose residential as part of that mixed use, they'd be certainly within their ability as part of the, that plan mixed use designation. But uh, I, I think that the fact that the, the you have that 60 acres, which is does not meet the criteria for a park uh, or a research protection area, as was uh, you know those criteria were designated by the DNR and were validated as part of that law con grant. I mean, they all signed off that that, that 60 acres is no longer met that criteria. So I mean, when you look at it, its position along the interstate uh, relative proximity to an interchange, I think that I mean, you can certainly have your own opinions, but I think that plan mixed use is certainly not out of the question there and I think is an appropriate land use. All right. My biggest concern is plans, plan mixed use, like a person said before, is it's a very broad spectrum. You can put just about anything in there. Yep. How do you stop things from going in there that shouldn't be, such as a big, huge box store or something that's going to draw a lot of traffic? To the I, I think it's up to the Common day. Council uh, yeah. when and if a rezoning petition is presented before them to re to review it and to determine if it's in the best interest of the city to allow that zoning to take place. Okay. What we what we have to do, and and the six at this time it's six men have to do is what they have to weigh the decisions, what makes sense in the right places. Where we're, you know, we've been accused of being so pro business that we don't focus on green space. But I always point to the fact that we're building acres and acres of city parks. Show me another city in in the region that's doing that. Yeah. So we understand the balance, and we right. care about that balance. Bottom line is that the folks that own the land have the right to develop their land, or at least approach the city about that right. So. We have to weigh all of those those factors. And I guess to maybe reiterate, uh, Falk Park probably grew by another half as part of this land exchange. So, I mean, it's it's a balancing act. You're right, but uh, the council is ultimately the one that has to make that decision. Yeah, and ultimately we're sensitive to the school being where it is. We're we're very happy that the, the Falk Park will have a southern uh, access point, which is really good because frankly most people don't utilize the Rawson Avenue access. And I think. You know, we are conscious as a council that you know we mixed mixed use means mixed use. We don't want to have one one thing that's dominating our storyline. We want to see a lot of different uses. So ultimately, you folks elect the re the representatives that s sit up here and serve, and I appoint the people that's the non electeds that sit on this commission. I think they make the best decisions they can make given all the evidence. Okay, and then as far as the properties in front of that 1830R parcel, um, once that is deemed mixed use, how easy would it be for somebody to come in and then change that to commercial, like the gentleman before me talked about? I mean, I, I'd never like to obligate future uh, councils or plan commissions, but I think it's it's reasonable that if that area develops, uh, g given the proposed changes to the comprehensive plan and the, the level of infrastructure that's there with the interchange, that uh, there's it's reasonable to presume that uh, if a change from those residential land uses to something which is non-residential, uh, I think that'd be at least looked at uh, in, in a favorable, favorable light by this staff, certainly. And uh, you know, like we're doing right now, we'd have to evaluate any proposal on its merits. And But I think that uh, certainly a change away from residential would be consistent with the direction that area is heading. Yeah, okay. not uncommon to see that kind of development on the interstate. Okay. Especially the only new inter only new interchange on in Milwaukee County in the last forty years, so sure. it's got a lot of interest. Okay, good questions. Thanks. Thank you. I don't have any more forms, but second call for public comment. Third call for public comment. I guess I have a question. You got first of all, you got to fill out a form, but I'm, I'm going to let you come up and speak. Just to give your name and address. You can fill it out after. Yeah, just come on up and speak. You can fill it out afterwards. Okay. Last night we just got a map from the Oak Creek School District. Just, the, just, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, name and address for the record. Oh, my name's Christine Strubing, and I live at 8562 South Cortland Drive. We okay. live in Apple Creek Farms. Um, but we had just learned that our students are going to be redistricted to the new school, which is wonderful. Um, but I also have the same concern about whatever is going on with the redistricting and the roads. Like, if we are going to be um, changing that to business, mixed business, is is there going to be two separate entryways to this? Or are they going to be having the same 
roadway coming in past the school to get to these businesses. Go ahead, Doug. I'm not sure I told you. And keep in mind, we I can't really talk about redistricting for the school district. I understand. That's their issue. I guess my mine. direct question is, will there be a, two the separate entrances? Right. Sure. Good, good what question. was planned all along as part of the tri-party exchange agreement, as you can see, and just to orient you, here's Drexel Avenue, here's the freeway, here's the, the school site, was a roadway connecting Drexel Avenue through to 27th Street. And we are working right now on uh, seeing if we can get that developed sooner rather than later. So yes, there's a plan to have at least two connections to not only that school district, but whatever develops within that section adjacent to Falls Park. So the main traffic will be going through a different road to get to those places that are being built up. Uh, the, the, the roadway, the infrastructure we de developed and designed to meet the needs of whatever develops there. So I can't say that it's not gonna be passing the school because whatever develops there, whether it's residential or anything that's allowable through mixed use, it will pass that area. But that's, again, the school district, uh, all parties knew that, that 60 acres would develop as part of that land exchange. Yeah, and keep in mind, the biggest school population is located on the state highway in the middle of Oak Creek. I mean, Edgewood School is located on Shepherd Avenue, which is a pretty busy street. Um, I get your point, though. I mean, we have to be sensitive to it, and that's ultimately why we have engineers that tell us how we can make that safer and how big the roads have to be to make it safe. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Third and final call. Seeing no more people coming forth, I'm going to close the public hearing. We'll move to discussion, commission discussion of item 5A, which is a comprehensive plan amendment to the 2020 vision, a comprehensive plan for the city of Oak Creek that would update the plan land use category and map two in the comprehensive plan for the properties as listed on South 20th Street, South 27th Street, West Drexel Avenue, and West Rawson Avenue, tax key numbers multiple. Do you have any additional comments, Doug, or do you mind me just open up to the commission? No. I think All right, open up to the commission for comment. Um, raise your hand since I don't have a recognition system yet. Alderman Bikavich? Uh I guess I'll speak on it because it does sit in my district, and I did have some calls from some residents uh, that were addressed here tonight. <coughs> I think Doug did a good layout of, of really the future vision of the city. And again, there are residential homes there. We're trying to be sensitive to what's gonna go back there, but as the mayor said, property owners have a right to develop what they wanna do. Uh, one, one man was up here and he described the change in the city. I'm sure those homes at one time that sit along Drexel Avenue, I'm sure that was all zoned agricultural and somewhere along the line, somebody got them to rezone it residential to put it in. Uh, you have to weigh out each development. Uh, we, have, we have some residential homes adjacent to an industrial park uh, across from my district on 13th and Drexel that to me absolutely makes zero sense. I don't know how that possibly went in given what the development already existed there with the industrial park was. Uh, the best thing you can do is try to buffer those. So for those homes, particularly those on the north side of Drexel, regardless of what went in there mixed use wise, whether it was business or residential, uh, we would probably try to address it with some kind of buffer or berm. Uh, again, it would come back before the plan commission uh, from their common council and we try to make it the least impactful of all. As far as Northwestern coming in and it wasn't said, but kind of being a bully or running the city, uh, I look at it more as a partnership. Uh, they're coming in, they're, they're looking for positive change within the city. I think they'd be reasonable to work with in that regard. Um, so again, if they so chose, because they have bought up some resident pr residential properties, uh, they may go along to, to buy up more if, if that's their initial plan or goal. But again, they would probably work with the residents. And keep in mind, when they put the interchange in, they had the state had to acquire a couple of homes. And the state came in and worked with those individuals uh, to the best of their ability. Um, if not, this isn't quite the same situation, uh, but the state would have been able to take those home under eminent domain for that particular purpose. But correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, it, that wouldn't happen on Drexel Avenue. Eminent domain, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> I mean, eminent domain is, it's, it's complicated. I mean, the city has the ability to do it under certain circumstances. No one's proposing no. that we're doing that and, here. And there's just no need on Drexel. With the ramp, they needed the land, they needed them homes. And, and they never went that far, so I don't want to be misquoted that way. Uh, but again, as, as things develop and change, 
uh, like the road on 20th. The road going through on 20th will hopefully be designed, and we do have one of the traffic engineers here, uh, to sustain whatever traffic is anticipated for the school and possibly some development going forward. So I would think that road would be adequate to handle what it is. And then again, as development goes, Doug has pointed out other entry points into it. So um, it's kind of a fluid situation, but again, it, it does fit the comprehensive plan. And uh, with that, as Doug said, we do have an obligation to keep that plan up to date. So um, I guess I'm for it then in that one, in that regards. And just to, I don't want to speak for Northwestern Mutual, but um, you know, seeing what they do as a company, whether it's downtown or whether it's in Franklin or you know, in, fu in the future in Oak Creek, I have complete faith that they'll do it the right way because that's the way they do business. Um, we're not interested in just throwing things up to, to fill properties. We want things to look and feel like they belong in the city, and that's you know, that's the same goal here as it was here. And I, at least the people I've talked to think this project, Darksville Town Square, is an overwhelming success, so, and already, and we're still under construction. So I expect the same or better out there. I think that's going to be when it's developed, fully developed, which will probably happen way after I'm gone. Um, I think it's going to be good for the city and good for the residents. Other questions or comments from the commission? Mr. Dickman? Uh, my comments don't apply specifically to this uh, specific amendment, but having been a member of the original group that uh, uh, developed the comprehensive plan in 2002, that was the whole idea, that we, the city had to continue to update it to reflect the changes in the city, and this is just one. I think we ha we've had other ones, and we're going to have continuing you know, more of them coming up which is what the state requires. We have to keep that plan up to date. Correct. Yep. Anybody else? All right, seeing none, motion on 5A. Kavich okay, will make a motion that the plan commission adopt resolution number 2015-04, amending the comprehensive plan and planned land use map for the properties at 7951, 8067, 8210, 8245, 8310, in 8351 South 20th Street. Uh, 174 1R, 1830, uh, 1901, 2200, 2211, 2300, 2305, 2319, 2361, and 2500 West Drexel Avenue, and 1965 West Rawson Avenue to reflect the changes in land use as indicated uh, by Exhibit A, uh, following the public hearing and adoption by the Common Council. Who's the cause killed second? Who's the cause of seconds? Roll call. Dick and I. Hold on one second. <laughs> Noted. You missed R. I did. Okay. There were a lot of numbers on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll I, correct that I will record. correct that. I will correct it and add the R on. Thanks for catching that. Thank you. Both of you, you had both of your hands up. All right. Do we get a second? Who's he second? Yes. All right. Roll call. Uh, to Dickman, I. Johnston, I. Kavich, I. Speedy, I. Krizikowski, I. Carell, I. Schiffert, I. Chandler, I. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to shift a little gears here. We're going to 5E. E. Just going back. Go ahead. I think I've got uh, still Carrie, just a clarification on that. 1830R. Uh, my copy does not indicate an R. It indicates 1830. What is the correct address? 1830R. Okay. Then it then it will stand. It Thank you. It was a typo. Just wanted to make sure. All right. We're going to shift gears. We're going to jump ahead to 5E. Um, Mr. Edwards from NARD has a four-hour drive, so we're going to give him a little uh, little uh, advance place in the agenda. So item 5E is a plan review of site and building plans submitted by Tyler Edwards of Menard Inc. for an addition to the existing building and an addition to the existing warehouse at 6800 South 27th Street. Tax key number 737-9040-001. Carrie? This is a request for a covered storage area and overhang addition onto the east side of the existing building. Uh, that's a 54 by 180 addition, uh, new recess loading dock, which would add 960 square feet, and a shipping center addition onto the existing warehouse, which would all be behind existing fencing on the property. 
Minor changes are also proposed for the existing garden center that would rec include removal of the west entrance and south elevation doors and canopy with a new garden center wall, but that really is not part of the review because that is just building modification. All setbacks in the proposal for the additions, however, are met. On your screen right now is the elevation proposed for the, um, the building modifications to the store. On the east, the proposed building materials include steel pro-rib panels in green to match the existing panels and loading dock materials to match the existing doors. That's okay. And then on the warehouse addition, again, Green pro-rib steel siding with a white pro-rib steel roof are proposed. While the proposed materials do not meet the requirements for acceptable exterior primary building materials per code, they do match the existing building materials in their respective areas. Additionally, the proposed modifications and additions do not lie within the visible perimeter of the building and therefore will not be seen from public streets. The plan commission may approve of the proposed building materials with a three-quarter majority and staff does recommend approval of such. The, plan, the staff, recommenda staff recommendation for the entire proposal is that the plan commission approves the site building and landscaping plans. Sorry, there are no landscaping plans. Please strike that. Submitted by Tyler Edwards of Menard, Inc. for the property at 6800 South 27th Street, subject to conditions one and two. Mr. Mayor. Questions from the commission? Mr. Chairman. Uh, are there any modifications for fire safety or HVAC? for the extended warehouse? Staff defers to the applicant. Mr. Kresic here is also could advise on that. Go ahead. Yeah, Tyler from Menards. Um, no, there wouldn't be any changes. It's only a small addition for trucks to back in and load materials out of the warehouse for delivery. Can you give your full name and address for yeah. the record, please? Tyler Edwards, real estate rep with Menards, 5101 Menard Drive, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Thanks. So are there any requirements per the city of Oak Creek that the fire safety has to change for the warehouse? Mr. Kresic? Mike Kresic, Oak Creek Fire Department. As with any project, we'll work with the applicant. Uh, once we have detailed drawings of the addition and the specifics associated with that, we'll be able to work with the applicant to address our specific ordinances. Generally, our ordinances will match up with state and national codes. There aren't a lot of variations locally that would affect this project. The only thing I would caution, and, and I, my assumption is that it would be done at some point, uh, I understand there will be an exit that is closed uh, as part of this project. Exits are designed to remove people from facilities based on estimated occupant loads. When you close off exits, those need to be calculated by architects as part of the rendering process to assure that there are enough remaining exits to handle occupant loads. Okay. Do you want to address that, Tyler? Yes, absolutely. We are doing this to all our stores. We've checked with architects and the International Building Code to make sure that closing that does comply with all the regulations. Okay. And the new areas will all be sprinkled. Good. That's a big part of it, too. Good to hear. Anything else? Uh, yes. One additional question. With the overhang, are there any trucks that will be in that area? No. Okay. No. So what, what's going underneath the additional so overhang? So the whole project, and we're doing this company-wide, is to add more covered storage to take products out of the yard and get a roof over them. Um, in this case, we have a pretty big warehouse, but all of our stores have three loading docks to handle our truck traffic and an overhang between the warehouse and or the, mm -hmm. between the garden center and the loading dock. Now, stuff that goes in there, maybe insulation, um, fiberglass pipes type stuff, it's just more um, overstock space. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really even for our normal guests. It's for stuff that gets stored there under a roof behind the garage door. All the new store have them, but they're open air without the whole wall there. Now we're just closing that off, putting the garage door. And yeah, a forklift will go in there, but no trucks. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Dickman? I think Kerry pointed out, though, that what I'm going to talk about is not part of the plan, but it's a building modification. 
and that's the elimination of the garden center entrance. Yep. Uh, probably you're doing it for two things. You don't have to have somebody there. That saves money. But also maybe people stealing things out of there. I don't know what the reason is, but it's a real inconvenience. I've used it many, many times. All my relatives that go there uh, use it because you've got these, these large lift trucks where you put heavy bags of mulch, landscape material, concrete block. Now you have to wheel them all the way to the front entrance or you have to bring or come into your car and bring it in, which, believe me, is a pain in the you-know-what, okay? I'm just saying that I think from a convenience standpoint, I, I, don't, I just don't think it's a good idea. Uh, uh, I know you have your reasons why, but I don't care for it at all. So, and, and everybody I talk to can't believe that you're going to eliminate that entrance. And we are doing it because it is um, rarely used. Uh, you may be surprised to know that someone mm -hmm. is staffing that entrance and it's actually unlocked only a few weeks out of the year. Uh, most of the time and most of the day, it is shut down and locked and you have to go that way anyway. It just, it's just mostly a, a weekend use in the springtime type deal. When you say it's not used, believe me, I, I know from my own personal experience and my neighbors, they use it all the time because it's so inconvenient to go to the front entrance when you're pushing a large uh, uh, cart with heavy material. But that's my comment. Thank you. All right. right. Thank you. Any other comments? Alder McAvers? Um, I kind of agree with Wally. I'm there a lot. And there's a lot of people using it. I'm stuck in line there. But that's really not the issue. Um, I just want to make sure you're adding three new docks. Uh, you don't intend to use that fire gate on the north end of the building in you know, the shape or form that those trucks in, do you? Oh, absolutely not. No, trucks will go in the same yard gate they use today. Okay, so they'll be coming around the south end. Yep. In the three new ones. Um, okay, that's about all I really got. Other questions from the commission? You got one? Good? All right. I'll be glad when we get our notification system back because I have to ask this every every time. Um, thank you. Um, motion on 5E. Crow moves. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go back. Crow moves that the through. commission approves the site and building and landscaping plan submitted by Tyler Edwards Menarding for the property at 6800 South 27th Street with the following conditions. If I may interrupt for just one second, there are no landscaping plans as part of this. This That is a typo. No landscaping. Strike the landscaping. Got one, it. that all building and fire codes are met. Oh. Two, that all mechanical equipment, ground building, and rooftop is screened from view. Seifert seconds. Roll call. Dickman, aye. Dunstan, aye. Grandma, aye. Kavich, aye. Tweedy, aye. Guzikowski, aye. Crow, aye. Seifert, aye. Chandler, aye. Ready to go. Have a safe drive home. All right, moving back to 5B. It's a review of conditions and restrictions for a licensed community living arrangement with, an, with a capacity of 16 or more persons and housing for the elderly, multiple family dwellings in excess of four dwelling units per structure submitted by Sean McKibben, Oak Park Place on the property at 1980 West Rawson Avenue, tax key number 736-8995-001. Plan commissioners will, rec will recall that this was recommended for approval at the meeting on November 10th. Uh, just to clarify, site building, landscaping, and related reviews will occur at a later date. One thing that the plan commissioners will be asked to rule on as we discussed at that meeting uh, is the parking. As proposed, there are 64 total parking stalls, not including any that might be in garages. Requirements per the code, elderly housing requires one stall per dwelling unit. Efficiency in one bedroom apartments in multifamily dwellings it requires one and a half stalls per dwelling unit. Two bedroom apartments require two stalls per dwelling unit. And I will uh, just remind you that again, back in April, Azura was approved for using the nursing home um, ratio as part of their CBRF proposal. That is one space per three patient beds plus one space per employee. This has also been incorporated into the conditions and restrictions. And if you turn to page three, item 3A, staff has recommended that a reduction in the parking stalls be allowed for phase one of the project. Phase one would include the um, memory care and um, would exclude the independent living apartments, which is in phase two. Uh, staff 
proposes that phase two be required to meet the minimum parking requirements for multifamily residences. On page six, uh, 6C, and I think there is a- Your page a, numbers are different than Yeah, I, I see that. So uh, if you look for six- Just say C, the heading. Is it talking about architectural standards? Yep. Okay. C, are you talking about? The facade of a multifamily residential building shall be provided with an acceptable brick or decorative masonry material that covers at least 65% of the surface of the total exterior wall area of the building. That's different from commercial buildings. Seven, which is building and parking setbacks on that same page, just clarifying what the requirements are. If you turn to the next page, 10, permitted uses. That says one licensed community a li living arrangement with a capacity of 16 or more persons and housing for the elderly slash multifamily dwellings in excess of four dwelling units per structure. And finally, time of compliance under 11 on that page. This is pretty much taken from the uh, Zura conditions and restrictions because it is a phased development. But under D, staff would like uh, plan commission guidance on whether or not this is the zoning on the property should revert back to RS4, single family residential, if the project does not move forward and the conditional use permit would expire. The staff recommendation is that the plan commission recommends that the common council adopts the conditions and restrictions as part of the conditional use permit, allowing a licensed community a living arrangement with a capacity of 16 or more persons and housing for the elderly slash multifamily dwellings in excess of four dwelling units per structure on the property at 1980 West Rawson Avenue after a public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Dickman. Uh, in uh, 10B, that's where you do state one licensed community living arrangement, 16 or more. Now, it's understood that I thought this was going to be for elderly, both parts. It doesn't say that. And what I'm concerned with is what the city of Milwaukee just ran into, having sexual predators go into a community uh, housing. And I don't know if, if the Before way Before you go too far on that. What? We go by the by the law here and, and our, the, our, our standards. And if, there's, if sexual predators are from our city, they, they have the right to come back here. We're not taking anybody else's sexual predators. Okay, but my question is, if this is this only going to be, that's what I was trying to get to, is this only going to be for seniors, the first part community living, or? Uh, the applicant here? Why, why don't you come up? I was under, under the understanding that it was, but it doesn't really say it there. Name and address for the record, please. My name's Sean McKibben. I'm with Hope Park Place, 719 Jupiter Drive, Madison. Thanks. And this will only be for seniors. Okay. Could we state that in here, or, or, or can we not do that? Yes. Okay. Because I, I, I mean, I'm just trying to protect ourselves. That's all. Okay. Thank you. A and then the other thing, and, and it really has to do, uh, I guess it'd be more with Kerry. Number three, parking and access. And you know, we talked about last uh, uh, last meeting, and you know, we uh, discussed this about the uh, the driveway on the south end of the property that exits out onto uh, 20th Street. And uh, the way it's written here, uh, we talked about the parking, et cetera, and how it should be paved coming in and out, but it doesn't say location. Uh, is it better to wait until we get the actual plans to talk about that? <coughs> well, site plan review is not part of the conditional I agree, that's review. what I'm saying. We can't put anything in there, we should just wait? Yes. Okay, that, all right, yeah. Okay, so thank for you. For what it's worth, I would tell you, we. We know that we have to move the drive, okay. and we're planning to move it further north. Okay. And then also regarding the parking, if it, to give you some sense of comfort on that, um, there's a lot of different categories of senior living. The folks here, none of these are independent living folks, meaning that they don't they they don't drive. Yeah, very few. So cars. we've got 40 units of memory care, which is our Alzheimer's residents don't drive at all. The other 40 units are assisted living. History has shown us about 5% of our units in assisted living will have a car. So of those 40 units, we might have two units that have a car. Yeah. So we're. I think it's more people visiting more than. Yeah, I mean else. it's it's family visits and staff, and that's really it. So yeah. I'm, we we're real com we're real comfortable that we've got more than adequate parking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Thank you, um, Alderman Guzikowski. Hold on one second, Arden. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, come on up. Mr. Kuzikowski has said you have the Our honor of speaking. 8540 South Pennsylvania Avenue. I've been kicked out of a housing complex when I was soliciting names. Good thing you said names. For, for uh, a position <laughs> in the city, for, for uh, a uh, position in the city. My question is, is there provision in this with the multiple, multiple housing for visitors parking? Because my car, my car was pulled away and I had to pay hundreds of dollars to get it returned. Because I parked in an area that was numbered. I hope you paid that ticket. There wasn't yet. any, the only street parking, the only, only parking they had for visit other people was on a street. Right, the applicant has indicated there is visitor parking. So hopefully Oh, you have visitor parking then. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Degner. Alderman oh, Guzikowski. And, and then we'll get to our famous guest in the back, second in the last row. The only question I have here is, um, it, it kind of ties in with what's gonna be going on on our next item. Um, are there gonna be any issues with the, this going on with the concrete plant uh, operating at the same time and um, you know, with getting in and out of uh, the building and location? Just quickly, the concrete plant is a temporary use. It is a temporary use and it's not accessing from the same area. It would be, the temporary use would be accessing, and we're getting off topic here, but it would be accessing from Rawson, whereas this would be accessing from 20th Street. Thank you. And just to clarify, we can add the, uh, the word elderly to the, the staff recommendation for the motion, as well as item 10B under 10B. permitted uses, licensed elderly community living arrangement. Okay. I, the reason that it was not included previously is because um, under the Azura plan, they did offer memory care to those who did not meet the definition of elderly. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Seeper, then audience member Beretta. Okay. I just have a question on 11B, phase two. We talk about 36 months from the date of adoption. Mm -hmm. Is that the phase one adoption or is that 36 months after completion of phase one. Now, what the time of compliance is saying is that the phase two would start within 36 months of the date of the ordinance approving this conditional use. Okay, thank so you. So the date that the council approves it. Okay. Former city clerk, Bev Beretta. <laughs> Name and address I for the record. The, this is on record? Okay. It's old timers night, we're getting all the <laughs> folks coming back. <laughs> no, I see. <laughs> I'm one yeah. of them, so I can say that. a great that. way to start. <laughs> Welcome. Beverly Beretta, 3736 East Oakwood Road. Uh, just a question, basically, is does this qualify as a CBRF in the terms of the law? Applicant can answer that. You got to speak on the mic. You have to come up. You don't have to give your name and address again. Uh, the memory care units are CBRF. The assisted living units are RCAC. And what does RCAC stand for, please? Well, it, in, in terms of uh, code requirements and state requirements, the CBRF is more restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, RCAC is, is more like apartment living, where memory care is um, it's, it's more challenging in terms of requirements. Okay. Yeah, um, for the clerks, they were... Um, Mrs. Beretta asked uh, about RCAC, the definition, and, w and what was the difference? I'm, not, I'm no longer very familiar with what the CBRF requirements are, but at one time I thought if it was designated or categorized as a CBRF, you could not restrict it to a specific type of individual to reside there. Um, now, I know you said this is for elderly. Um, should this development not proceed the way he planned, could it then be turned into something else? A halfway house. Or Doug or Carrie? They would have to comply with whatever state law says. State law um, requires certain things with the, um, with the operation of a CBRF. They'd be restricted to the conditional use as allowed by the city in terms of, you know, the type of development that would be there. 
a, license, a, ha a halfway house is not the same thing as a CBRA. Okay. Um, if, if the ownership changes, will the conditions and restrictions pass along to the new owners? Yes. Yep. The conditions and restrictions run with the land with the use. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the commission? Commissioner Chandler? Let's see. For section 11, uh, item B, we only refer to phase one. Should we also refer to phase two here? Because throughout this document, we refer to both. The reason that it says phase one is because phase one has to occur within 12 months. If that doesn't happen, <coughs> phase two, it can't happen either. Okay. So that, that's, that's why it's worded that way. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Alderman McKavich? Um, not to open up a can of worms, but again, when we did Azura, uh, obviously you know this is geared towards elderly patients. Um, I don't know where the definition of elderly kicks off, if it's at 60, 65. Um, but if we were to have a person younger that has a condition or through an accident needs the services of this home, um, are we restricting that person from not only care but the business from providing it? Uh, we, we ran across this with Azura. And, and by no way do I want to open it up for individuals that don't need this type of care, but um, what do we do in a case like that? Or does the applicant just not deal in uh, people younger than a certain age? Well, go, what, go ahead, Carrie. What I can say is that Azura specifically stated in their business proposal, or however they operate, they don't restrict as a company the people that they provide care to. Um, the applicant has stated that they specifically cater to elderly. So this that, applicant. This applicant for this particular project that we're speaking of tonight. Well, then I guess that answers my question because I wanted to make it clear to the applicant that he isn't going to get anybody then um, young like myself in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really? But anyhow, no, I just wanted to make clear with that because we did have a very similar case. And uh, again, there, there's circumstances where the families need this care. They want these people in this community for whatever reason. Um, and I just don't want to restrict that out. Um, just to address the parking going forward, I guess I'm pretty comfortable as long as he has adequate visitor parking. Uh, I've had had the, uh, I, I have had the need to go to facilities such as this. And as, as the applicant stated, there's really um, no residents there that normally have cars or have a need for them. So I am, I am okay with that. Um, I was glad to hear he's backing up the driveway. And as far as the property goes, it's, it's kind of a challenging property. So I think it, it really does kind of fit. I don't know who'd want to, again, right off the entrance ramp there, kind of develop a subdivision or anything of that nature. So um, I, I think it's kind of a win-win for the area as long as we can uh, moderately impact that traffic by uh, planning on that driveway one way or the other off of 20th Street. That's it. Okay. All right, motion on 5B. Which will make a motion that the plan commission recommend to the common council that the common council adopt the conditions and restrictions as part of a conditional use permit allowing a licensed community living arrangement with a capacity of 16 or more persons and housing for elderly multifamily dwellings in excess of four dwelling units per structure on the property at 1980 West Rawson Avenue. Just a point of clarification that's licensed elderly community living arrangement. So noted. <coughs> Motion was made. Need a second? Kuzikowski, I'll second. Kuzikowski seconds. Roll call. Dickman, aye. Johnston, aye. Pro, aye. Speedy, aye. Kuzikowski, aye. Pro, aye. Super, aye. Chandler, aye. And just a general comment about uh, assisted living and, you know, places to take care of people that need memory, memory care specifically. We're not going to shy away from these uses. I, I've, I've, not tonight, but I've heard other people weigh in and say, not appropriate uses with a uh, with a rapidly aging population, myself included. We need to be we need to pay attention to that population. These are high quality facilities, well maintained. They meet our standards. They are good additions to our city, and we're going to continue to when the, where they're appropriate. We're going to continue to add them. All right, that's my editorial comment. Five C is a um, review of site building, landscaping, and lighting plans submitted by Tony Miranda, Grace Lutheran Church. 
for an addition to the existing building at 3381B East Putes Road, tax key number 864-0062. Carrie. The request is for a 485 square foot addition onto the southwest portion of the property. That would include a vestibule with guild room, new restroom facility, and a small coat rack. Plan commissioners should know that the board, um, the board of zoning appeals granted a variance to allow the building to be sited 19 feet from the west lot line and for the roof overhang to be 15 feet from the side lot line. They did this back in, I believe it was October. All other setbacks are met in the proposed plans. Building materials are shown in the uh, rendering, which we are bringing up right now. This is the color rendering showing the addition onto this portion of the building. Building materials proposed include cement board siding on the west, south, and east, windows and lighting fixtures on the south entrance um, elevation. Per code, the use of cement fiber products requires a three-quarter majority approval of the plan commission. They are proposing cement board siding. Staff re recommends approval. And as part of this, they are um, removing but also replacing and enhancing some landscaping. So what they are going to propose uh, are some plants on the south, or I'm sorry, this would be the west side of the addition. Um, this is also some enhanced landscaping on the east. I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. So I'm, this is the east and this is the west. I'm learning my directions. <laughs> no, this is south. This is turned. That's north. This is north. This is flipped. So that's actually south on that side. Yeah. Uh, we got Carol the directions Carl, figured out? <laughs> we'll get it there. All right. Yeah, okay. I got it. I got it. <laughs> it's not what I said? Anyway, that's the landscape plan. The staff recommendation is that the plan commission approves the site building and landscaping plans as they are proposed, submitted by Tony Miranda of Grace Lutheran Church for the property at 3381B East Putes Road, subject to conditions one and two. Mr. Mayor. The applicant is here, great facility, great community partner. Any questions from the commission? Motion. Mr. Dickman makes a motion that the plan commission approve the site, building, and landscaping plans submitted by Tony Miranda, Grace Lutheran Church, for the property at 3381B East Pewts Road with the <coughs> following two conditions. Number one, that all building and fire codes are met, and two, that all mechanical equipment, ground, building, and rooftop is screened from view. Seifert seconds. Before we uh, take the roll call, name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Peter Ogorek, architect with Perspective Design, 11525 West North Avenue, Wauwatosa. Uh, the reason I wanted to interrupt you is I appreciate the, uh, the quick approval, you know, or the motion for approval. However, one item that I would like to bring up is condition number two uh, relative to the screening of the rooftop equipment. Um, the rooftop equipment that's in question, the part that, that we're going to struggle to screen is going to be on the uh, north side of the existing building. If you're familiar with the site, that's the side that the school, the lower level school is on. Um, that portion of the building is basically a football field away from, uh, from Pewts Road. Um, so it's in the neighborhood of 300 feet from Pewts Road. The rooftop equipment that we're proposing to put on that portion of the building is the condensing unit for what's called a mini split system. Those are uh, basically small air conditioning units. Oftentimes you'll see them in like uh, computer, uh, s computer rooms, things like that. So it's not a large air handler like you would see on a commercial building or something um, like that. So what I would uh, respectfully request is because the screening is likely going to be bigger, more intrusive, um, quite frankly difficult to accommodate because of the snow load that it will generate on the existing roof. Um, respectfully request that, that that equipment that's on the north side of the building not be required to be screened. We do have units on the south side of the building and on the west side. Uh, unit on the west would be screened with landscaping as Carrie has previously discussed and the, port and the unit on the north roof would be behind a um, parapet wall. So 
Did you make this request of staff before tonight? I did, yes. All right, <clears throat> staff comments on that? I'm trying to locate the exact plan that shows them on there. Give me a minute, please. Is there any way of turning the heat down in this room? It's like a furnace in here. Oh, you like it like this? All right, to staff, are we, is it, can we work with them on this? Is it something that we, I mean, I, I don't like surprises, so, you know, when we're in the motion phase and then I have to wrangle through a, a screening issue on a rooftop. We'll work with them. All right, staff indicates they're willing to work with you on it. Thank you. Council, is the commission comfortable with that? All right, roll call. Uh, Dick Benai. John Stenai. Bill I. David Chai. Speedy I. Kuzikowski I. Corell I. Secret I. Chandler I. Good luck with your addition. All right, uh, last, last one of the night, it's a, um, where's my, it's a temporary use permit request submitted by Tim, apologize if I get this wrong, Free Rich, Free Riches? Ferris, okay. Uh, Michaels Corporation for a temporary concrete batch plan on the property located within the WIST dot right away at I-94 and Rawson Avenue at the exit ramp. Carrie. The request is an extension to allow the existing temporary portable concrete batch plant within that right of way to remain in place through the completion of the 27th Street project, which is anticipated to complete at, on September 30th, 2016, or about there. Plan commissioners will recall that a temporary use permit was issued to the Zignago Company for this property on April 22nd, 2014, and extended through December 1st, 2015. Michaels Corporation um, has been awarded the state contract for the 27th Street project and has been operating under the current temporary use project permit issued to Zignego Company. <coughs> the proposal does not include any crushing. What it does include is stockpiling of concrete aggregates transported to the site by dump trucks and semi-trailer trucks. It would also include staging of miscellaneous construction materials, overnight parking of con concrete trucks, um, there's also information stating that tankers will haul cement to the property throughout the project, the mi mix of which will be hauled to the paving site as needed. They are approximating 30 trips per hour as part of that operation. Dust control and road cleanliness will be maintained using a water truck and mechanical broom. They expect four to five employees on site daily with hours of operation between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. They've requested that uh, the hours be extended to Saturday as the project requires. However, staff recommends that the same hours of operation approved for Signego be applied to this request and was included in the proposed conditions of approval. The staff recommendation is that the plan commission approves the temporary use permit for the temporary concrete batch plant within the right of way at I-94 and Rawson Avenue subject to conditions one through four. Mr. Mayor. So consistent with the former use or former uh, tenant, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday through Friday, Saturday, 8 to 5. That yep. is what the current temporary use permit allows. All right. Um, this is just a general question. I know we, we've had, this is our second or third one on that site. Um, and this doesn't really has no relevance to this discussion, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So when are, when are we going to see this site done with concrete batch plants and return to a green state. At this point, the, my understanding is that the temporary use is being requested because there was a delay in the 27th Street project. Right. Assuming that the 27th Street project completes as of the date that they are anticipating now, which is the end of September, hopefully the site would be restored by the end of October. Okay. Is that the applicant's understanding as well? Yes. Perfect. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Dickman. My concern only is that uh, the way this is located, the cars coming off the freeway and heading uh, east <coughs> are going to be, you know, going, if they go right past there now, and this is a lot of truck, they said 30 trips an hour, there's going to be a lot of trucks coming in and out of there, and I'm kind of concerned 
about the potential for accident professional snow. The way it's been running now in the last year, because I, I live right close to there, I mean, there are trucks coming out of it, but they're far and few between. But this is a lot of trucks, 30 an hour. I have I'm no idea what the current use rate of use is on that batch plant. Uh, I can I tell you, we haven't had seen a huge uptick in accidents over there. I think any accidents would be related to freeway versus the batch plant. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, well, I that's why I want to know why, how long it's going to be there. Yeah, that's good. I mean, okay. Well, we said it was not going to go yeah, one I know. more year I know. beyond. Well, that was with that call. tenant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alderman Decatur. Um, again, I'm, I'm kind of going off uh, Mayor Scafidi's coattails here. Uh, we've, had, we've had different batch plants come in, and we've had some local businesses kind of complain that why are we allowing them in? We have such businesses, and again, it's, it's not totally relevant. But then by the same token, we see the licenses roll over, or the lease, so to speak, year after year from one corporation to the next, and they kind of roll just, they just keep going for a couple of years on end. Um, and again, this doesn't have much to do with it, but I think we should look at our permitting uh, and our fees associated with it. And the longer it goes, the more it's going to cost you to keep it there, uh, whether it's within your control or not, because it causes us traffic congestion. It plugs up our roads. They do haul on our city streets that we are responsible for, whether that's Ross and uh, thir no, not 13th, but Drexel, things of that nature. And it rips up our roads, having those plants in place. It's heavy equipment. Uh, and I love heavy equipment, let me tell you. I, I love to see them trucks rolling. I like construction barrels. I love all the building stuff. But again, I think we should look at this going forward. Um, and again, this may not go on forever, but with the infrastructure in this country being what it is, there's going to be more and more road work going on, and you're going to see more and more of this in different parts of the city. Um, although I am in favor of it, uh, I would like to look at that going forward. And there's no reflection on you as the applicant. No. It's just a frustration <laughs> that we hear from residents who see uses like that and they, they don't go away for a while. And frankly, this the use for 27th Street may go away, but it'll soon be followed up by Ryan Road Bridge Project probably or something like that. You so. know, or farther down the I-90 trailer. It's just, yeah. it's just again, frustrating. it's progress. It's progress. So. Okay. Mr. Corral. Uh, I guess the comment is, when this came the last couple of times, if we don't go with the temporary batch, we're hauling trucks over more space, more miles, more damage to the road. So we kind of got swayed into this was the path of least resistance. So I agree it's got to end at some point, but it still would make the same sense. Yeah. Mr. Seaver? Uh, I have a question about the noise level that this equipment makes while you're doing it. The applicant want to come up, name and address for the record? Tim Ferricks. I represent the Michael Cor Michaels Corporation, uh, 517 West Main Street, Brownsville, Wisconsin. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to say I'm, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back in Oak Creek. I've been here off and on through the past five years. I was part of the Mitchell Reconstruction Project, and we had a temporary use permit for a site over on College Avenue. I was also the project manager for the Drexel Interchange Project and the Drexel Paving Project out here. Uh, as well as the airport spur, so it's always a pleasure to come back here. And I want to uh, just call out the city for the hospitality that they have extended to both me and my company and the people that travel with us. It's been, it, it, we're always welcome when we come here and uh, we patronize their businesses and they treat us very well, so appreciate we appreciate that. Uh, it's also nice to see this beautiful facility that you have. And however, uh, I could help you out with concrete in the, in the parking lot if you ever <laughs> There's desire. a reason for those pavers. <laughs> <laughs> But as far as the noise level goes, uh, the concrete plant itself is state of the art. And I don't know if you've been out there at all, but when you do get uh, uh, probably 100 feet away from it, you can hardly hear it run. And we've taken uh, uh, precautions now to change the backup alarms. Always seem to be the biggest nuisance in neighborhoods right now. But they have a new alarm out that's kind of a, a, a buzzer instead of the loud beeping sound that's muffled now too so there's no disruption to the local residents as well. So uh, noise-wise, I don't see where it's a problem, but I've never had any complaints in the other projects that I've been on in the area right now. As far as the project itself is concerned, the first phase of it is already complete for this year, and the actual work out of that site next year for the concrete plant, it's plant itself is about a five-week period which will vary throughout the course of the summer because of the project staging. 
so there's not going to be a lot of activity coming out of there. Uh, in the regards to the, let me just address the comment of the 30 trucks an hour uh, coming in and out of there. That's probably on the very high side, a project of that magnitude there and the lower production given its city curb and gutter and things like that. It's probably, cl probably closer to 20 trucks an hour with a concrete paving operation. So I hope that answers your questions on the noise. If uh, any other, please. And I can tell you, I have not received an email or a phone call on any of the batch plants since we've had them in, up and running. So, uh, To follow up on that, too, again, I was part of all of the projects here for the last several years, and I have never had a comment or a complaint over any of the batch plants that we've had, both uh, dust-wise, uh, maintenance, um, noise, or anything. We were set up close to the trailer park over there off of College Avenue. And we've never had a complaint. At least I, it, it never got to my level if there was one. Okay. Anything else? Motion. Um, Mr. Mayor, before you get to the motion, based on the conversation, I would just like to uh, throw this out there for Planning Commission consideration. Under uh, Condition 4, that the temporary use shall expire on October 15th, 2016, and that the site would be restored by October 31st, and uh, fifth, condition saying that there would be no crushing on site just recognizing that they're not requesting any but then also s kind of addressing some previous concerns from previous temporary use permits with uh, concrete batch plants so you you're advocating a two-week site cleanup time well that's for discussion but uh what about end of november that would be acceptable. We need to get it done before it freezes. Two weeks okay. is a little quick. Yeah, let, let's go. Um, November 30th? That sounds good. Okay. Acceptable. Yeah, thank you. Um, we get a motion on that? One, that all building and fire codes are met. Two, that the use is limited to approved with stop projects in the area and that the truck traffic is limited to state and county highways. Three, that the hours of operations be limited to Monday through Friday between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. and Saturday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Four, that the temporary use permit shall expire on October 15, 2016 and site remediation will uh, have taken place by November 30th 2016 let's make it just site cleanup site cleanup restored yeah restoration restoration restored um, and five that there shall be no on-site crushing of materials okay Chandler second Chandler second roll call uh, Dickman I Johnston I David I Speedy I Kuzikowski I Grell I Seifert I Chandler I have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. And I hope uh, going forward, uh, you, you talk about 20th Street. I hope you do that in concrete as well <laughs> in the future. <laughs> do everything. In Message concrete. received. Uh, well, five E is completed, so motion to adjourn. So we'll move to adjourn at 723. Corral seconds. Roll call. Dickman I. Johnston I. Corral I. David Chai. Scooty S. Kuzikowski I. Corral I. Super I. Chandler I. Have a great night. Uh, if you feel like walking on Thanksgiving morning, we're walking for an hour at 8.30. Come on out, burn some calories off before you stuff your face. Have a great night. <laughs>